Many people will go their whole lives not realizing that this group of insects even exists. But if you're a gardener, you're all too familiar. Because this is the order Thysanoptera. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. So today we're talking about the order Thysanoptera, or the Thrips. You gotta admit it's a pretty cute name. Thrips are gonna be kinda tricky to identify, but that's not because they don't have distinguishing characteristics. It's because they're just little dudes. They're just little baby guys. Most thrips are like one to two millimeters in length. But the good news is, is that they have a unique-ish body shape for their size, as they're very slender. But the fun characteristics require a bit closer of an examination. Thrips are most well known for their feathery fringed wings, like you can see here. One of my clips got corrupted, so I'm gonna say it again. The fringes on the wing help make the wing somewhat porous, which helps to reduce drag in flight. And this is critical for an insect as small as a thrip. Even so, they're kinda crappy flyers. But they try so hard. These fringed wings actually give them their name. Thysanos means fringe, and Pteron means wing. So Thysanoptera means fringe-winged. Another interesting trait of Thysanoptera is they have a very unusual life cycle. Thysanoptera are technically hemimetabolous, which follows a three-stage life cycle from egg to nymph to adult. But they seem to have independently evolved a development that more closely resembles holometaboly, or complete metamorphosis, which goes from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. Thrips hatch from their egg, feed, enter a non-feeding stage we call a pre -pupae, then a non-feeding stage we call their pupal stage, and then molt again into their adult stage where they still feed. It's very confusing. A non-feeding stage between immature and adult is essentially what a pupal stage is, but they evolved this independently, and also they have two non-feeding stages instead of the usual one, so it's kind of just their own thing. Also, their immature stages very closely resemble their adult stages, just like in other hemimetabolous insects. Because of this, some people refer to their immature stages as nymphs, while other refer to it as larvae. So pick which one you want, I won't judge you either way. That was a mouthful. Thank you for bearing with me, but we're not done yet. As if they couldn't get any weirder, thrips also commonly practice parthenogenesis, where females can reproduce asexually and develop fully viable offspring from unfertilized eggs. But my favorite trait of thrips is that they have asymmetrical mouthparts. They're asymmetrical because they only have one mandible. They use their left mandible to slice the outer layer of whatever they're feeding on, and then they have sucking mouthparts to suck up the juices. They do this with pollen, plant tissue, fungi, arthropod eggs, and more. They're actually very closely related to the Hemiptera, which explains their piercing, sucking dietary habits. Though like many Hemiptera, this method of feeding can cause problems for many of the plants they feed on, including our crops. Thrip feeding can cause direct damage to crops through changes in color and shape that make the fruit or vegetable less marketable. Perhaps more serious, however, is their transmission of plant viruses. Only a handful of thrips spread economically important plant viruses, but those that do make a big impact. Western flower thrip, Franklinella occidentalis, is perhaps the most famous of them. They spread a multitude of viruses, including but not limited to tomato spotted wilt virus and impatiens necrotic spot virus. This affects both our agricultural and our horticultural industries. Some estimates place annual global damage from this thrip alone at over 1 billion American dollars. But like I said, it's a very small slice of the thrip diversity pie that causes us major issues. So let's stop slandering all of Thysanoptera. Thrips do some pretty cool things too, like pollination. Many thrips feed on pollen grains, and they end up transporting some of these grains between flowers. They've even found some thrips encased in amber from the Cretaceous period that were loaded with pollen. So they've been doing this a long time. 
And some thrips are actually predators, feeding on damaging pests such as scale insects and some mites. And a ton of thrips are just little dudes going about their business. So how can we help these odd little critters? Well, good news. Thrips thrive in a ton of different environments, meaning that different groups can be benefited in a ton of different ways. Many love flowers and plant tissue, so planting native flowering plants as well as native trees and shrubs can give them all the food and habitat that they desire. Others love leaf litter and fungi, so you know what that means. Conserve your leaf litter. Don't just bag it all up and throw it away. A ton of species thrive in these environments and even require leaf litter to make it through the winter months. As for fungi, conserving the dead wood on your property can help propagate fungal bodies, which a variety of insects, including some thrips, feed on. This order gets a bad rep because it contains some pretty significant pests. But though they can be hard to tell apart, thrips are very diverse in their ecologic function. And with such a unique life history and morphology, who knows what other wacky things we might learn about this group. Shout out to Gia for suggesting covering this very slept on order of insects, and thank you all so much for listening. Remember to subscribe to keep up with future orders, and I'll see you all soon. Peace.